shockwave going out would be enough to knock people off their feet as far as Macon, Georgia, mm. if that was where the epicenter was. Yeah, people at trading posts as far away from the epicenter as Macon, Georgia is from this were knocked off their feet. People sitting on chairs were knocked over when the blast wave hit. So it gives you an idea of the strength. Now, why this is so important is that what has been discovered by studying the population distribution of these size of objects suggests that what happens is that what we're seeing here is a single random event that is not completely random. It may be that there are Tunguska swarms out there. In fact, there's a lot of evidence to back that up. Swarms <coughs> of Tunguska. And it could be that a swarm of Tunguskas is, has had major effects on civilization without us knowing it because a swarm, you could have a thousand Tunguskas, but they don't leave craters. But if you had the Earth encountering a swarm of Tunguskas over a matter of several days or several weeks, it would be like an all-out nuclear war, and its consequences would be devastating. Now, we've barely, barely touched upon the mounting evidence that there are, in fact, clusters of objects the size of Tunguska or Tunguska that may be only counted literally in the thousands. We'll quickly move past this. I suppose you saw the article about a week ago, the guys saying that their Tunguska was probably a lot smaller than they thought, so maybe many more of them. Yeah. Would you tell that? No, that's about it, isn't it? That's all I know. Did you, did, you get, did you hear what he said? No. 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 Uh, well, the, the figure that we've always used, like I said, was around 140 or 150 feet. And I haven't, I've heard about the study that he's talking about, but I haven't read it, so I, I don't know the specifics of it. So just tell us what you know. That, that they now think it was about half the size, and therefore there are a lot more of them, and, and that, and that they may be more common than, than originally thought. Mm -hmm. That's not good news. No, not at all. But it's not good news. Jeremy, we only want the good news, though. I'll shut up for Okay, this, this clearly demonstrates the relationship. What meteor stream are we looking at here? Venus. 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 Who, who says what? Leonid. Elizabeth, you're right on things. This is the Leonids because there is the uh, constellation of Leo marked out. Yes, the Leonids. Okay, and here you can see this is a time-lapse photograph. So it's very clear if you look at these and you trace these paths back to their common center, it actually turns out to be right almost dead on Regulus. So I feel a strong affinity for this particular constellation and in fact this meteor shower because Regulus is almost dead on my ascendant for, for you astrologers. I had my, sign, my, my astrology chart done twice and they both said my ascendant was almost marked by Regulus. I thought, hmm, that's cool. I like that. <laughs> it was only years later that I appreciate the significance with the Leonid meteor shower. Now, the Leonid meteor shower, there's three, in my opinion, three <coughs> meteor showers that I believe the evidence supports the conclusion that they were intimately involved in the affairs of human beings, i.e. causing cultural social and cultural and natural catastrophes. One obviously is the one we've just been talking about, the Taurids, but the other one is the Leonids, and the third one is the... Reachback, reach back, reach back. Mm -hmm. what did you say? Mm -hmm. Well, the Pleiades is associated with the Taurids, but they're not, the, the Pleiades are the stars that are mm -hmm. way out there, so it's not the Pleiades, but that was a good guess. Dracons. The what? Dracons. The Draconids. The Draconids. Right. What about the Draconids? Now you guys would have to go back a year to dredge that up. The Great Fires. Right, October 8th. They peak on October 8th, the dates of these great fires in history. Right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Peshtigo. Peshtigo. Very good, Jerry. 
You get an attaboy, Jerry. With a table. I've shown you this, but I gotta show it to you again. This was taken by a high school student skipping school, I think, if I remember the story. He was outside with his camera and he heard a hissing sound and looked up and this thing was coming through the atmosphere, burning up. Now that would be scary. Well, you can understand when we haven't gotten into this in one of my pro, uh, programs. Well, maybe it is this one right here we're looking at. I've, I've collected all of these eyewitness accounts. Going back, if you go back in the old astro astronomy literature from like 1850 to 1950, um, <coughs> like uh, monthly astronomical <coughs> notices, um, I forget, there's three or four of them. And the no every month they would report eyewitness accounts of meteors. I don't know, they don't really do that anymore unless they're really spectacular. But every month they would, people would write in these letters and, you know, talk about these fireballs and meteors that they had seen. So if you go through this old this astronomical stuff, you can read these first-hand accounts of what people saw. And it's amazing stuff. It really is amazing stuff. I mean, it, you can't read that and then go read sacred writings like the the Bible or the Vedas and or even the Mayan stuff and not see the parallels. I mean the parallels are so striking that you begin to think well you know you read the book of Revelations and what they're describing in here is not something purely on a visionary level but actual events that people were collectively experiencing. But typically people thought when they begin to see multiple fireballs, they thought that it was the end of the world. That is one of the most common reports that you'll hear over and over and over again. These fireball comes in and it creates, for one thing, when they come in, they create sonic booms. And they can create multiple sonic booms. So oftentimes people will be in their house and all of a sudden they'll start hearing a succession of booms. And then they'll run outdoors and then they'll see something like this in the sky. And frequently the, the descriptions are, that when the thing passes overhead, it appears as if the sky opens up. Like in some cases, uh, people have described it almost like as a scroll opening up. And then once it passes, the scroll rolls closed again. Or somebody described it almost like the sky got unzipped. And then it got zipped back up again. And when you go and you read the ancient accounts, they're so striking what these people are describing in, for example, the apocalyptic literature, that it sure, to me, becomes obvious that we're talking about the same thing here. What you said a minute ago about hissing, that's another reason to think of the symbology of the dragon or a serpent. Yes. It comes and, in and, hissing. Right. And when you read these accounts, that's one of the things that's, again, very commonly reported is there's a hissing sound followed by a succession of booms. I've shown you this. This shows the orbit of two of the Taurid meteors, but they define, see here they are, they're coming towards the sun this way, coming around this way. Here's the Earth. Uh, Earth's orbit is right here. So the Earth is going around like this. The meteors are going, the meteor stream is moving this way. The Earth in this position is looking at spring equinox. If you look there, there's Aries right there. So when the Sun, when you have Aries, the Sun, Earth lined up, that would be spring equinox about March 22nd. The Earth is moving from here over to here, takes us to late June. If we move the Earth from here back to here, we're late October, early November. So when we're coming around this way, we pass through the stream with the stuff coming like this. If you look at it, it appears out here that they're coming from the Pleiades, which is out here in space. And this is the Halloween meteors. And then the Earth comes around. You know, right about now, we're, we're, what, a little month and a week or so past Halloween, a couple of months. So the Earth is going to be in this part of its orbit. Come March 22nd, it's going to be right here. Come next late June, it's going to be passing through the stream again when the stuff is coming this way. And you can see that if we're passing through and the thing is coming from this direction, it's going to appear as if it's coming from the direction of the sun. And that's precisely where the Torah, where the Tunguska object appeared to be coming from that morning of June 30th. And this is all of the scientific evidence and research showing how uh, the Torrid meteor stream and Anki and Tunguska and all of these other things are all related. 
and we're not going to spend our time on this. This would be something that I can give to you guys that want to read this on your own uh, in more depth. It'll, it's all here with the sources. Okay, here, here we go. Here's a beautiful torrid fireball that was photographed. And That's the kind of thing, right, Randall, all that text that will be on the website and then people that become members will have access yes. to all that to yes. read all those things. That's right. That will be on the, uh, the, inner, the inner chambers. Okay, here we have a painting that's estimated to be 14,500 years old. It's Taurus the Bull. The, right there, three stars of Taurus. Here's the V-shape of Taurus, the, the constellation. And you know, how many of you can recognize, you know how Taurus, I mean Orion is out there with the Taurus the Bull bearing down on him. Here's the belt of Orion. And here is the bull bearing down on him, and right here is the Pleiades. <coughs> now this is very, this is typical. This is one example of, of a number of these bull effigies that have been found painted in the Ice Age caves. At this point, no one has proven conclusively that the reason that they were so keen on painting these images of the bulls and creating these maps of the sky, well for one thing it tells us then that at least certain associations of the zodiac are, are that old, 14, 15,000 years old, which in itself is pretty darn amazing. But the other thing is, is that, you know, it may very well be that these people knew that something associated with Taurus the Bull and the Pleiades was dramatically affecting life on Earth at the time. And one way of their commemorating this connection that they had made was by painting these bull effigies in caves where when they were taking refuge from fireball storms, they had nothing else better to do except paint these paintings on the walls. And why, you think, would people spend so much time deep in caves, probably for the very same reason that they find uh, heterogeneous bone deposits in caves all over Europe and in uh, North America and South America, where you have totally incompatible species of animals whose mortal remains are found uh, accumulated together in caves where they died together. And you can imagine from what you saw with that picture of that fireball, imagine that there's hundreds of those things in the sky over a period of days or weeks. Where would you take refuge? In a cave or deep underground? 